we are live now okay thank you uh thank you dr devakant and uh, welcome to the 21st episode of late night retina the topic for today's discussion would be uh, i will how to how do you go about with uh, i will explants and another some brief about iris claw lenses uh for the panel for today we have dr prabhu bhaskaran he is a consultant vitro retina in arvindai hospital in chennai and we have dr vaibhav sethi he is the consultant at arunde deseret eye hospital in gurgaon we have dr chitranjan mishra he is a medical officer at uh, arvindai hospital madurai and we have dr uh, uh, abhishek gupta uh, he is a uh, senior resident at aims patna so uh, we can start with the session and we can ask dr uh, abhishek gupta to kindly uh, start sharing his screen and we can take it from there dr abhishek dr abhishek are you there sorry i will just okay thanks avnish and thanks yoshi for giving me this opportunity i will just share my screen this is a video of dropped okay is my video visible yes doctor abhishek please so this is a video of dropped iol a foldable iol has dropped in the vitreous and it is resting upon the retina so i am do, doing a good thorough um, central vit core vitrectomy and anterior vitrectomy and freeing all the adhesions around the iol So after achieving a complete thorough vitrectomy, now I am grasping the end of the haptic with the truth forceps and bringing it up at the pupillary plane. So you can see this. I am trying to maneuver it. So once I have brought it over the pupillary plane, so I have introduced an, a second forceps and through handshake technique, I have transferred it to the other forceps. So a preformed tunnel has already been made. so and since it was a foldable iol so th through minor ad adjustments i brought it in the ac so foldable iol doesn't require much of effort if the pupil is well dilated wait 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 so and then through sequential uh, pulling by forceps and through a small tunnel only i could explant it So once this is done, so in the same sitting, I implanted an SFI one through the standard technique of just uh, extruding the one haptic out, and this is the final look after the implantation of SFI one. This this is the video which this is my surgery. Can you, doctor? Can, can you, doctor? Uh, can doctor Abhishek just uh, keep that screen on uh, for mm. your uh, for your uh, video? Uh, I think uh, nicely done video where you have actually shown how to go about with doing the uh, vitrectomy, then getting the IOL into the AC, then bringing it into the into the AC, and then from there explanting it out. So I will ask start asking questions to all our panelists one by one. Uh, let's get with uh, Dr. Chitranjan Mishra first. Uh, Dr. Chitranjan, can you just tell me what? How do you go about with IOLs? Who are like now? We have different case scenarios here, where the IOL sometimes uh, stays back into the anterior vitreous space, sometimes in the mid cavity, and sometimes in the uh, over the retina. So, how do you actually go about with uh, IOLs which are actually in the anterior vitreous space? Do you actually? Want to draw do a vitrectomy and let the eye will fall into the vitreous cavity, or do you have any other methods? Can you give us some pearls about how to go about with eye wells which are actually in the anterior vitreous phase, and uh, how do you go about with them? So, uh, like, uh, see, Avnis, uh, if the eye well is in the anterior vitreous phase, the surgeon will be tempted to take it through the tunnel. Maybe in the anterior route, he will try to take it. But uh, since we are going to the posterior route, we are posterior segment surgeons. Then it's better to allow it to fall. Do a kind of descent vitrectomy. Allow it to fall. We can take it after that. By that, we will be avoiding the vitreous tractions that will be happening. 
so uh, that is the technique and especially if there is a three piece pmma lens is there which we can tuck it and we can use it as a sfi oil as dr abhishek has told in this in that case also there is no need to make another tunnel we can allow it to fall down we can take it we can put that eye oil into uh, we can take uh, do it uh, into the sfi oil and if it is a foldable eye oil like that uh, also we can allow it to fall and we can take it later in all these cases actually anter segment uh, the tricut assisted anter vitrectomy actually helps in that case we will kind of ensure that there is no vitreous in the papillary plane so a complete a vitrectomy and the posterior root my plan will be a posterior root if it is even if it is not and sometimes you, you will see there is half of the like one haptic is there in the papillary plane or it is protruding towards the uh, anterior chamber in those cases maybe when the infusion is on the kind of eye oil is protruding it is kind of uh, asking you to take it through the anterior root then only in that case only i will take it through the anterior root otherwise i will try to do a vitrectomy allow it to fall then take it nicely without the traction on the uh, anterior retina yeah thank you dr chitranjan i'll come to dr uh, vaibhava uh, for the if there are eye oils which are actually in the inter, mid vitreous cavity can you give us some pearls as to how do you go about with those eye oils which are actually in the vit vitreous cavity do you actually do a thorough vitrectomy or how do you manage with the intraocular pressure and is there anything which and how do you actually try to hold those with the which kind of forceps do you use and how do you go about with it so uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, and uh, the lovely late right night uh, learning for all of us um, if the uh, eye oil is the anterior vitreous mid or posterior vitreous my suggestion and my practice always even for a beginner would be initially if you can't see it stain it so you can put a little bit of diluted tricot so that so that you can stain the vitreous because even in anterior vitreous as dr chitran is saying if you pull it you might actually actually pull more vitreous along with it and cause uh, peripheral breaks so a thorough vitrectomy is what is an ideal situation that should be done when in, when it's in the mid vitreous and posterior vitreous cavity then a vitrectomy is a must and uh, not just clearing uh the uh, uh, uh the vitreous around the eye well but also uh, also i would recommend if you can do a proper peripheral vitrectomy that's very very important because you're going to be placing an intraocular lens in a in a position which is not normal either a iris fixation or a sclerotic fixation so that area should also be clear of vitreous otherwise you will because of the undue manipulation you will end up with having peripheral atrial breaks later on and the patient actually loses more than gaining and uh, as of the second question when the iol is there what options do we have we have a forcep we have active suction and we also have our vitrectomy probe so with whatever you're comfortable with you can use initially you can try with the forcep go if it's a foldable lens you can go at the optic haptic junction and then pick it up and uh, basically pu uh, pull it up vertically but you, you have to be very very careful and very very certain that there is no vitreous around the iol so when you doing a vitrectomy very important when i i will dangling and moving very freely in the vitreous cavity that is when there's a good sign that there is no vitreous around it because your cutter is cut of the vitreous and now it's lying there at the posterior pole so you can go with either active suction with a fluid or with a, a forcep or even with a cutter with suction you can actually just hold the optic head edge and pick it up sometimes thank you dr vaibo that was a good insight into it So let's ask Dr. Prabhu if the eye oil is actually sitting onto the retina. So how do you go about with them? And any uh, pearls uh, you want to discuss about? Yeah, Avnish, uh, you know uh, what I feel is you know uh, generally you know you tend to uh, remove it uh, anteriorly immediately when you see it in the AVO. That temptation is normally uh, you know controlled. If it's uh, if it's a subluxated eye oil, uh, you know you see the aptic. Pretty much in the anterior chamber, then you, I would probably remove it uh, without doing a PPV. But uh, otherwise, you know, I, if it's in the AVF, I normally do a thorough vitrectomy, make it fall down on the retina, then I, uh, you know, handle it. And the only thing in the video, uh, you know, what I would do, uh, you know, slightly different is, uh, you know, I would use PFCL to slightly lift the retina. Sorry, lift the eye oil off from the retina, and then I would use a forceps and catch exactly. you know the aptic optic junction or sometimes over the optic so the idea is when you lift it you know uh, when you, you you don't have to you know bend your forceps too much anterior to anteriorly you know uh, i think you'll get my point you just lift it 
you will easily get the uptake uh, you know well at the pupillary area and sometimes into the anterior chamber so that you can your exchange of uh, you know uh, uh, uptake from one instrument to another uh, becomes very simple so that is one uh, tip i would say you know in that video i saw uh, dr abhishek was holding the tip of the aptic so that probably i would avoid because taking the tip to the another instrument you need to maneuver too much probably that time you will have corneal distortion that's when probably you lose the eye well so probably that i would avoid so uh, question uh, dr prabhu i think uh, one question yeah, yeah. when it when the eye well is actually sitting on to the which uh, so do you do a thorough vitrectomy followed by or do you do some core and try to actually maneuver it up because sometimes the posterior hyalur does help in actually in you know so like i i, I would not i would not do pvd i would not do pvd induction i would do a core vitrectomy ensure that there is no vitreous uh, you know entangling the eye well eye well is i'll ensure that eye well is free and then i would simply use pfcl bubble as you know a little small bubble of pfcl would you know uh, elegantly lift the reti- lift the eye oil off the re- from the retina so that would help me i w- i would you know get an edge if i use an uh, use pfcl so with that i'll go about uh, i would want to ask the panelists as well as dr abhishek uh, your experience other than pfcl how do you go about i mean have you used uh, flu or prabhu sir has told pfcl is also a good option uh okay. but i have not tried much of pfcl i generally prefer to directly pick it up uh, pinch and pick it up at the haptic at the tip of the haptic and in yes that, in that case if you are directly picking it from the retina the uh, you know the best option is you can use an active uh, uh, extrusion cannula so you can just safely take it using a forceps when you are not when you are not using pfcl is probably a risky proposition this uh-huh. is what i feel Sometimes it happens that the eye well is actually over the macula. So, do you actually maneuver it over the disc area so that it it becomes more easier sometimes to pick it up no. uh, with the force? Generally, force. if if eye well is at posterior pole, sitting over the disc and macula, both are crucial structures. I generally tend to avoid dragging them over the posterior pole. Gen- uh, generally, I lift directly. I try to lift it at one go. PFCL is also a good option. Once I had tried PFCL, actually, what happened? The PFCL slid. It, it forms a convex bubble, na. so it slid and it uh, and it got sandwiched between the pfcl bubble and this this part of the retina so yeah, true true that happens but that you can probably you, you can probably avoid by you know uh, injecting pfcl bubble slightly away from the eye well yeah. so that you can sort of you know PFCL. keep increasing the bubble and then at the same time you can push the eye well you know uh, slowly so that is possible so eye well will sort of you know uh, tilt and get on top of the pfcl bubble So once yeah. you get a small edge, then you can easily pick it. Yes. So Abhinis, I, I'll generally this works best in my like a direct pinch. But yes, PFC is also very good option. Please available. So another thing is all these patients which are coming to us, this eye will drop or something. Uh, actually, their uh, prognosis, visual potential is very good. It is kind of six, 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 nine cases. All these cases. So we cannot afford to kind of making any breaks or anything in that. So PFCL actually helps in giving a cushion kind of thing by which the uh, disc and macula are protected, and we can uh, easily remove it. And regarding what Dr. Abhi said, told actually sometimes it slips, but slightly with maneuver or putting more one or more or two bubbles of PFCL more, we can easily bring it to above the PFCL surface, and then we can kind of make it vertical and bring it to the. So, only issue with pfcl is sometimes you tend to forget that you have injected pfcl that you one should be aware of it yes. you know you remember you imagine you in you know, a inject pfcl and remove the eye well you switch over from posterior to anterior then you if you have to do sfil and at the end of the surgery you might forget so it's always you know uh, i always tell my assistant that you remind me i will also remember but i'll always uh, even today you know i was telling my sister that you remind me at the end of the surgery whether pfcl bubble was removed or not this is a standard practice that you know otherwise you tend to remember uh, i mean you tend to forget yeah another problem i'll tell you prabhu sir another problem is uh, one or two bubbles of pfcl they actually remain at the end because we are not doing the pvd induction and they actually get trapped inside the vitreous one or two bubbles they will not come even if with your uh, fluid yes, yes. uh, heart trip or soft trip uh, fluid so for that actually small trick is that you take uh, one cc saline and you just inject it over there they will get dislodged from there and then after that you can easily take it out so absolutely 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 agree uh, 
uh, that was a very nice uh, tip, Dr. Chitranjan. Moving on, uh, if you have an IOL with the bag which is dropped, so any tips or anything different any one of you try to do? Uh, I will with bag. Dr. Prabhu, you can say. Yeah, I, uh, I've done a few cases like that. The only thing is, uh, you know, uh, lifting it from the retina will not be an issue. But uh, what I do is after I bring it to the avia, when before I exchange, I would make an opening. I would sort of, you know, make an opening uh, between the optic and aptic uh, so that, uh, you know, you are grasping or exchange and grasping becomes better. So I will not, uh, without without that opening, I will not probably have the guts to exchange. Okay. Another, another thing I, I always do is, uh, you know, when you remove the IOL through the anterior road to the limbus, I always keep an additional uh, forceps, uh, generally, uh, you know, spatula. I depress the limb, also sort of allow path for the optic to come out. Your optic will easily come, but the optic is big. So... I sort of uh, sometimes uh, now sweep the iris, sometimes even the capsule also, so that optic comes out easily. Many a times you will be pulling, but the optic will be stuck. Even if you sweep just the uh, you know iris, sometimes a capsule, it may be a capsule or caps. So unless you go under and then retract the capsule, the optic may not come. That's when probably the optic optic junction also gives way. Then you will uh, sort of you know the case gets complicated. So you should always uh, make sure the path for the optic is good. So that is something which I would stress that it's very important. So moving on, I, there's one more question. Whether if, Is there any difference when you are actually picking up a rigid IOL or a foldable IOL? So any uh, pearls on that, Dr. Chitranjan? You are telling with the bag complex, it has... No, not the bag. If the, if the IOL you see into the vitreous cavity is actually a foldable one, how do you, do you have a different approach or do you actually... It, is it similar to if you have a rigid eye lying onto the this thing, which is so, cavity? Like almost similar, but I'll tell you if it is a three-piece uh, rigid eye oil, and if I'm planning for a for <laughs> eye oil to do the scleral fixation of the same eye oil, then the kind of there is no need to uh, explant it. I can put it in the uh, scleral tunnels. But if it is a foldable eye oil, as Dr. Obisa has uh, shown in the video. You just take it like that. And another small uh, uh, tips in the PMMA, like uh, rigid IOLs, uh, like it's a combination of what Dr. Prabhu and Dr. Abhishek were telling. Just make it uh, stand direct, kind of vertical, like hold it in the optic, uh, haptic junction or mid of the uh, haptic, you hold it, make it kind of erect so that when you uh, when you kind of uh, try to take it out through the tunnel, it will be the, the other haptic will be there in the pupillary plane. So you can take it easily uh, through the the help of the uh, assistant, surgeon, assistant sister or nurse is helpful in these cases. Any other panel can... I, I, I feel, uh, you know, uh, foldable IOLs are easy to uh, remove because uh, with the forceps, we'll get a nice grip. But with the rigid, uh, the thing is it might sometimes, you know, uh, just stumble. It might uh, slip off from your forceps that you should be aware of. So your grip is extremely important. So, and your aptic optic junction, uh, you know, you should be really careful. Okay, so <laughs> that problem is not probably not much in uh, foldable uh, single piece IOLs. Yeah. Okay, Another great. instrument that can make a life easy is the chandelier. We all use it for a lot of cases, and uh, if you place a chandelier, I mean, it will, uh, especially in the rigid IOLs and in three piece lenses, because as you say, as Dr. Prabhu mentioned clearly, you know, maybe going towards the retina with the forces may be a bit tricky especially initially. So the chandelier will help. You can actually have suction in one hand and then you can just uh, handshake it to the forcep and then lift it up. So that way, you know, you don't have that issue of uh, touching the retina. Uh, that's a good point, Dr. Uh, su suction is actually good. Uh, the only thing, uh, only thing one should remember is, you know, uh, when you switch over from posterior to anterior, uh, one tends to, you know, take your uh, foot off from the pedal. So that should not happen. You should constantly keep it you will, so that, you know, your, your suction should be on when you maneuver, when you take your next instrument and do all of that. When you switch out to anterior segment, ensure that the suction is on and good. So that is something, uh, you know, beginners will miss. So uh, chance of I will drop is high. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on, uh... 
going to a question where you know like now we have actually grasped the uh, iol and now we are trying to bring the iol from the vitreous cavity to the anterior anterior chamber so what uh, trips uh, tips do you people want to discuss whether with respect do you do any modification with respect to using more visco or do you change the uh, intraocular pressure so that you know the iol as you were saying that you have to have the suction continuously on uh do you actually do uh, how do you actually prevent the iol actually falling back into the uh, vitreous cavity and you try to bring it up and any change in forceps or maybe you, do you use a macpherson or do you use an iris repositor so that it kind of slides out into the anterior uh, chamber and from there uh, we can explant it so any tips uh, regarding how do you actually bring about the iol from the vitreous cavity into the anterior chamber we'll start with dr chitranjan your take oh, like, uh... to uh, mention about the visco even though the anterior anterior chamber and posterior chamber are almost the same it is there is a connection is there still it's better to use some visco because uh, we can't afford to uh, lose the endothelial corneal endothelial cell so better to use visco uh, second thing is uh, from bringing it to the mid vitreous or from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber we have already discussed and regarding the kelman macpherson thing actually it really helps and as i told especially if there is a smart uh, assistant is there they will also help you in bringing it out extra uh, kind of uh, taking the iol uh, away from the tunnel so and the regarding the uh, pressure uh, pressure we should always do in a kind of uh, low uh, lower settings otherwise the iris prolapse will be happening over there so we need to avoid that other panel can add dr weber dr weber dr prabhu sir Yes, I think uh, what I know I do sometimes is that uh, instead of uh, uh, after you held the uh, uh, iol vertically and brought it up with the forceps, then if you made a side port, you can actually put in a dialer through the side port or a spatula and levitate the iol into the AC. That actually reduces the amount of collapse of the globe because if you actually go with a MacPherson or a iol holding forceps and you, op- you collapse the globe because you're going to open a tunnel, that can actually lead to the further drop because then your all your uh, your uh, focus is on the tunnel when you opening it up then the is then the cornea folds up and collapses so you can actually uh, go with the side port and then levitate it up into the anterior chamber and then very comfortably bring it out you can do that as well dr prabhu yeah uh, you know i i i think for me uh, what is important is my second forceps i always you know take my second forceps usually as spatula i ensure that i go under the optic i optic and then sort of pull the aptic so the optic t- you know comes above my second instrument and then i sort of lateralize the tissues either it is a either iris or a capsule sometimes i lateralize and at the same time i'm under the optic so that the optic comes and there is a good pass so that, that is something which is very important for me so uh. dr abish one prerequisite is a well dilated pupil because sometimes uh we tend to operate in a mid dilated pupil and then we uh, then it is very difficult to maneuver from the anterior vitreous into the ac which i have learned over a period of time so first is in show, better if it is mid dilating uh, generally i will do a given a ac uh, inject adrenaline and ensure that pupil is fully dilated especially when it is post op day 1 or 2 where there is inflammation a lot of inflammation so pupil will not dilate that much and generally the primary surgeon is in a hurry to get his iol explanted out and implant a new one so one thing which i have learned over a course of time that in order to and we tend to gratify that the primary surgeon it is better to wait for some time let the inflammation resolve and better to take up that case after one or two weeks when the inflammation is resolved resolved cornea is clear and pupil is uh, maximally dilated because once a pupil is maximally dilated it is very easy to bring it into the ac either by any of the man- maneuvers which the panel panelists have already described so this thing is very important generally we uh, which initially i have done mistake uh, just to gratify the primary surgeon i have operated in post op day 1 or 2 and that time there are uh, striat keratitis is there plus cornea uh, cornea is hazy and uh, iol is sitting over the macula then to grasp it is it, first it is very difficult in that hazy cornea and when you tend to bring it up then the pupil is only mid dilated so this makes life worse for us so this is one prerequisite which i have now started following very diligently 
That's a very good point, Dr. Abhishek. Uh, there was one question from YouTube by Dr. Ayush, where he is asked about whether do you cut an IOL within the uterus cavity and bring it out, or do you bring it into the AC and then cut and so on and take it out? So, any takers for this? Dr. Weber, your take? When do you cut the IOL, uh, or do you cut the IOL at all? And which ones? I, I normally uh, create a tunnel, so I normally with the sclerotic tunnel because in such cases you are not looking at a refractive procedure so you can very well uh, just bring it out through the tunnel but in case you want to cut the IOL which I normally tend to cut in the ICU chamber and into the mitral cavity I'm not very comfortable we are going to uh, implant a foldable SFIL, then only we can go through this limited uh, uh, length tunnel. So in that case, we have to, even if we are planning to cut, we will cut it in the anterior uh, segment only, in the anterior chamber only. Then we can engage the cut half of the optic and we can slightly rotate and take it out. That is one option. But if we are kind of, we have a big sclero uh, kind of corneal tunnel, in that case, there is no need to cut it. So if at all we are going to cut it, then it will be in the anterior segment and we have to engage it and then rotate it in and take it out. Dr. Prabhu, your take on it? I, no, I, yeah, I, I, I normally don't cut the, I don't like to cut the eye oil. You know, I feel it's more traumatic than uh, just simply removing it by enlarging the section. Uh, you know, it, it's not that, you know, uh, elegant to cut inside and uh, bring it out. I, I don't think we, we, we would achieve anything uh, better. I normally don't cut. Okay. okay. So I think uh, this uh, closes some questions on I will explain. Uh, we'll move on to the next case by Dr. Vaibhav. He will uh, let him, uh, Dr. Vaibhav, if you can start sharing your screen and then from the remaining questions, we can take it in that session, in the, that yes. part of the session. Yeah. Dr. Vaibhav. Can you see my screen? Uh, Yes, we can. Yeah, if we can start playing it. Yes. 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 Sure. So, uh, I'll be taking you to step by step of some of the ways of, in which I manage this uh, dislocated intraocular lens and uh, how I place an iris claw lens. So, this was an elderly male who had a dislocated uh, eye well and back complex. So, what I do is I already pre place my ports, and I'm before that, the first thing I do is I do a contrail peritomy because I'm sure I'm going to explain the eye well in this case. As it is a foldable eye well, there's no place to place it in the sulcus as well. So I make my coronal tunnel properly because now the globe is, is, uh, is virgin and basically I'm not, uh, there's no hypotony in that particular area because it becomes difficult creating a tunnel later on sometimes. So after uh, placing a ports and an infusion cannula, do a proper vitrectomy. This is very, very essential as we've all, already discussed that clear the back complex and clear the vitreous, do a thorough anterior vitrectomy all across, make sure that the IOL is free from vitreous all across. So I normally do a PVD and I'm, and because it really helps me in, and make sure that I'm not putting any vitreous when I'm uh, picking up the IOL. So no polar traction on the IOL is a must. Make sure there's no vitreous around and the uh, telltale sign, especially if the IOL is a bit peripheral, you know, it, one of the haptics is, uh, is stuck to the periphery and you might just tend to you know uh, just pull it on, pull on it and pick it up don't do that because there is some bitterness there the only way you could you're going to be sure is when the eye will fall back on into the on the posterior pole so in my case when after i'm done with the pvd and there's no bitterness there i'm sure about it in case you still have a doubt you can even gently stay in with slight tricot not too much because that will disturb your view slight tricot and then you can either induce a PVD or at least clear the vitreous around the IOL. So you show absolutely certain initially. And after that, what you can do is I normally do it in a foldable IOL case. I use my ILM forcep and gently hold in the optic haptic junction vertically. So the uh, important thing when you're holding the, uh, grasping the uh, IOL at the junction is don't put too much of force, you know, because you tend to pick it up. When you put too much of force, you kind of tend to lose it there. And also when you're going in, pinching the IOL at the uh, surface of the retina near it, just have a small pinch. Don't open your jaws too much. So just like you do picking up the ILM, same way. So you want a very, very minimal amount of the, just exactly you want to hold the optic haptic optic junction, bring it up vertically. Vertical kind of helps you. So after, after doing that, just be stable and keep holding. 
then you can just with the keratome extend and open your tunnel. This in this case, if you're just holding it normally, also nothing will happen to the eye. You can see the eye may be dangling, but it's perfectly fine. So now what you can do is you can just hold it in one particular area. After you held it, just wait with the McPherson, and now you can uh, instead of pulling it now, it's better. I I'm holding it, so you can just levitate it above comfortably with your dialer or a spatula into the anterior chamber. And here is one another area where people make mistakes because even I do the same thing sometimes. When you're in a hurry take, to deliver the IOL out, you forget that the 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 trailing haptic is right now stuck to the iris, uh, uh, is basically is uh, looping the iris margin. So if you pull it too much, you can cause error dialysis, and you can uh, you know then placing an iris flow IOL or your SFIL becomes difficult. So avoid that. Be careful that you deliver it properly. You curve it around. Very very important to check. For the periphery, whenever you want. Now, in my case, I'm going to be placing an iris claw lens. Very, very important before you go into the uh, before you go into the anterior chamber, check the patency of both sides because sometimes it might be fused. You never know, and then you're stuck. So what do you do if one side is enclaved and other is not? Then you actually you are in a catch twenty two situation. So check the patency on both the sides. Sometimes it can be fused, manufacturing defect. You never know. So just hold it. Be comfortable. Place in pilocarpine. Place in visco. Once you've done that, your AC is well formed because you're going to do anterior chamber maneuvers. Preferably place valve cannulas because it will be easy for you to maintain your IOP. So now I've already made my two uh, side ports at uh, 180 degree apart at three and nine o'clock. You can make it accordingly. It's always better to go slightly posterior limbal or posterior limbal, as I'll tell you why. Because it helps you to enclave better, and your visualization while enclavation is better. So now, after placing in the AC, just uh, rotate it so that it's, it's exactly in the position of the side ports. Now go inside, hold the iris claw lens, and maneuver it one of the haptics below the iris plane, and slightly gently with the other hand. You can either you can also what you can do is you can place the side the your spatula or the Uh, side port instrument before you do this procedure, so that also can sometimes help you. So after that, just uh, slightly lift up the uh, iris tissue wherever your hap the clip is, and what you need to do is you need to feel for the inclination, and you confirm it visually by a dimple. So you, what you can do is either you can just directly press on the and uh, iris and put counter traction, but make sure that you don't uh, clip the Pupillary margin or near the pupillary margin because then you'll land up with an eccentric pupil, and patient will have uh, post-operative difficulties. So avoid that. Go to the mid-periphery, mid-peripheral iris tissue, and uh, take your spatula or your Sinski or your 27 gauge needle. After you enclave one side, make sure. As you can see here, there is a dimple I could see. Maybe slightly difficult to see uh, for you, but it's there. And uh, I'm quite sure I've enclaved one end because I felt it. That's very very important. So what you can do is you can just run over the iris tissue with slight pressure, and you will hear the, you will actually feel that uh, click happening or that snap happening, and that indicates that there is some amount of iris tissue that's enclaved now. The more the iris tissue, the better it is, the enclavation is. So after you're done, don't go and uh, go don't go for this other side port. What you do is wait, place it visco elastic. That's very important. Switch your hands for better maneuvering. Now, again, just bring the other side of the. Uh, Uh, haptic underneath the iris and just slightly uh, you know hold it up so that uh, you have the mount so you, so the, this see the problem that i have so what i did was i made my incision slightly more corneal so what this does is this actually hampers my view but uh, because i have done this procedure in past so it was not very difficult for me but initially when you started doing this procedure it might be difficult because do my collapse your uh, forceps Are opening the uh, tend not to open the tunnel totally, but your your focus is right now on the enclavation part. So if you have a more anterior or more corneal uh, incision, you'll have corneal folds, which will actually hamper your visualization, as you can see here. So there actually a bad visualization, but because as you could see, you can see there's a dimple here that's come up. So very very important to press and have counter traction slightly, and uh, the way to be sure about. Uh, is that another way is just tap on the optic you see it's centered it's there it's not fallen down so there's no clearing so and also what i do sometimes is well, i mean most of the times is create a pi so you can create a pi just to be, make sure there is no pupillary block and finally suture the ports or just close them the way you want if they're not leaking so 
Thank you, Dr. Weber. That was very exhaustive. Can you just keep that slide uh, still? Can you just keep sharing that video yes. so that okay. we can sure, discuss? Sir. Uh, yes. So one thing which was actually which was discussed in the chats also is about actually how the amount of uh, vitrectomy one does and whether does one induce a PVD. So that needs to be discussed here. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Uh, Chitranjan. What is your take on how much amount of vitrectomy do you do in these sort of patients? Do you do a, only a poor sort of vitrectomy or do you do a very thorough vitrectomy, induce a PVD? And uh, how do you do, do the uh, debulking here? In, in patients for SFI. Yeah. As a posterior segment surgeon, whenever we're going into the vitreous cavity, it is always kind of gratifying to do the complete uh, PVD induction and uh, near complete vitrectomy. But in these cases, particularly SFIL cases, what is our practice, like our center practice, there is, we, we don't do PVD induction usually in all the cases. The reason being, uh, like the left out, the, uh, P, the vitreous that acts as a cushion that protects kind of thing, especially if you're not, uh, if I've not used PFCL or if accidentally the nucleus or the I will falls on the uh, disc of the uh, macula. By that, I don't mean that it's just like a corbitotomy, like your uh, endophthalmitis or uh, something. You do a quite a, a good vitrectomy, uh, no need to indent or kind of scleral indentation and all, but maximum whatever visible vitreous is there, we can remove it, but no need to induce the uh, uh, kind of PVD. And another uh, thing is that by inducing the PVD, sometimes we uh, kind of tend to make uh, small breaks, which we can't afford to in these cases, which are having better visual acuity. So these are the points why we don't induce the PVD, but there are quite a number of surgeons which, uh, who uh, induce the PVD and the reason also I have mentioned. Dr. Prabhu, your take on in inducing... Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with uh, Chitranjan. Uh, I don't uh, induce uh, PVD. It's not a default step for me uh, in uh, both dislocated lens as well as uh, I will drop because it acts like a cushion. It's, 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 a, it, it's a protective thing for you. At least, you know, before you, uh, you know, get away with the step. So before you, uh, you know, do the uh, lensectomy or remove the eye oil, it's definitely a protective thing. I will not induce. So I, I, I will induce only if there is a need at the end of the surgery. This is what I do. Probably, you know, uh, nine, you know, nine out of ten times I don't do. Sometimes, if the, you know, while doing a lensectomy, if the, you know, pieces are shattered and I am unable to clear it off completely, so stuck on the, you know, posterior uh, pole, then I induce sort of, you know, instead of going and chasing each and every bit, then I induce a PVD and finish up the show quickly. So that is one thing. Another thing in eye oil removal, if I am unable to remove the PFCL bubble, which I, uh, you know, put to lift the red eye oil, I rarely tend to induce PVD and remove, but most of the times it doesn't, uh, I, I, I will not need that, uh, you know, thing. Easily it comes off. Very rarely it might, I might, but in lensectomy, sometimes I do that just to remove the shattered particles. Otherwise, I don't do PVD induction. I feel it's a protective thing. We don't have to. Uh, but the, the key thing is, you know, if it's stuck on the vitreous, you know, you are creating a bowl and then doing everything. But if the nucleus goes to the uh, vitreous, if the eye oil goes to the vitreous, then you should stop. You should, you know, uh, religiously come out and take a vitrectomy uh, probe and do the vitrectomy, ensure that it's again free, then you continue. If you don't do that, probably you'll end up in problem. problem. So, you know, PVD induction is not a must, I feel, yeah. So where do you actually, unless there is a lot of manipulation, do you, like you don't do a PVD at all? And how important is to see the periphery in these sort of patients? Because I remember when I was doing my, when I was learning to do actually SFIOs, I had that hiccup that, you know, it, it, doing a PVD would help me out and uh, doing a peripheral examination does help because a lot of times I have seen like, you know, like three months, six months down the line, you have a good IOL setting. And suddenly at one edge, you could see that the retina is starting to detach and there is some traction over there if the vitreous is not cut for like nicely. So can you actually tell us like uh, where do you actually uh, look into when, to, when you want to induce a PVD? Dr. Prabhu or Dr. Vaibhav can help us. Yeah. Yes, actually, the aim of any surgeon, as Dr. Prabhu rightly said, is what he's comfortable with. And finally, what we want to achieve is the aisle should either should be placed properly or should come out without 
injuring the retina and basically clearing of the vitreous around the eye well. If the person can do it without the uh, help of a PVD, that's well and good. But uh, in some time, what happens is if you go in for the suction, like you know, or if you want to go in for the forceps, sometimes what can happen the vitreous that is around the eye well that's acting as a cushion can sometimes also be caught up with the suction uh, opening, and that can actually cause more trouble than help you. So it's a, I mean. It's a gray zone, if you ask me. There are, you, even in the comments box, you're finding it's a 50 50 or 60 40 situation where people are doing PVD and some people are not doing it. So, basically, and all are successful. So, finally, there's no not, no one way to. So do you do a PVD are, or you don't do a PVD? I do, do, I do, I do PVD whenever when when possible. When I do a PVD, I think I, I don't, I, I take a chance, I induce a PVD unless, you know, I mean, I do it. I do it. To be, but then again, as you said, it's a gray zone. Uh, anything else, uh, Dr. Abhishek, if you want to add for this inducing a PVD? Generally, I also don't do PVD. My basic aim is to clear the central vitreous and anterior vitreous, check the periphery, and try to bring it out. Because uh, sometimes I have it. Uh, why we should do a PVD? It is not a retinal detachment case where vitreous is pulling track. Putting traction over the retina because okay. one drawback of PVD is uh, is a, PVD itself is a risk factor for creation of breaks in the periphery. Yeah. So, another thing I want to stress, I want to you know, um, you know, I want to uh, mention this that you know, sometimes inducing a PVD might be risky. You will have to ensure that there is no. Uh, say, hydrogenic breaks that you are creating in the periphery. If you are creating PVD in these cases, ensure that you have not created any hydrogenic break. You have to do a thorough examination. Uh, you know, all of that uh, are there. So it, it doesn't, yeah. you know, it, it comes with some cost. So you need to, uh, you know, weigh that. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, there was uh, one thing which we noticed in both the cases when the eye well was actually into the AC and now we have to pull it out of the, uh, you have to explant it. So when do you actually extend the tunnel? Do you actually, as that question was there, whether you cut the eye well and bring it through the same FACO tunnel which was made or do you actually extend the tunnel? And if you're extending the tunnel, when do you do it? Because when it is actually into the AC, do you want to extend the tunnel as what Dr. Weber has shown or do you actually extend the tunnel before and go in into the vitreous cavity and then bring it out? So what uh, pros and cons are there for both of them. So when do you actually extend the tunnel uh, in these sort of cases? Like it's like removing an IOFB. So when do you actually uh, do a extension of your tunnel when you're going clear cornea? So Dr. Pr Prabhu, you can answer this. Yeah. Uh, so wh what I normally do is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, if it's an IOL draw, uh, dislocated IOL, I sort of do a vitrectomy and inject PFCL and ensure that the eye wall is lifted and I, I can get an edge. I do up to this point and then I come out and then I create a tunnel and I enter also, I you know sort of uh, completely enter the AZ and then I go inside. I'm not going to do any you know, maneuver at this stage. I'm just going inside, uh, usually with my uh, light pipe in my uh, right hand and with my left hand, I take the instrument. I sort of uh, you know change it and go inside, just lift the eye oil and bring it to the AC or AVF, then I enter. So that my tunnel is already open. So I don't open the tunnel when I'm you know, already op you know, catching the aptic uh, in the pupillary plane. So that some, somehow I feel you know, doing all of that, uh, there is a chance that you might uh, you know, miss the eye oil because you know, corneal distortion and sometimes you know, uh, fluctuation, IOP fluctuation, all of that can happen. So the chances of missing an eye oil at that time is definitely there. So I tend to open it completely and do, it, do the exchange. So that doesn't happen that uh, the eye will, I mean, the IOP kind of fluctuates more when it is like you've done the tunnel, like before actually taking it up. And if, if the tunnel is good, if the tunnel is, uh, the wall effect is good, then I don't think, uh, you know, uh, you have an issue here because you're not going to do much manual. You're not going to do vitrectomy. You're just going to go inside and just lift. You're not going to do anything else. So I, I don't think it's an issue. So do you actually bring down the intraocular pressure somehow when you're maneuvering these things? If you're seeing the eye well floating too much into the vitreous cavity, so when you have like you've extended your tunnel, 
So do you actually do some changes in your intraocular pressure or you just keep it as 30 or 25? No, I, I generally don't do much with the intraocular pressure unless there is a gross uh, iris prolapse and all. But if the tunnel is good and you know everything else is fine, taken care, I don't think that's an issue. But the, as I said, my second instrument is always my, you know, uh, uh, this thing, weapon. Right, right. Dr. Chitranjan, your take? No, I agree with uh, Dr. Prabhu, sir, what he told. Na? So, uh, I uh, make the tunnel completely. And if it is a good uh, tripunnel uh, planar uh, uh, tunnel, the good valve effect is there. So, it does not egress actually. Iris or contents, they, they don't uh, come out uh, outside it. So, Dr. Vaibhav, actually, uh, his dexterity and uh, biomanual controller is very good. That's why he could do it holding in the... Uh, actually, I have not tried that. That needs a lot of control and dexterity. So we extend it, then only we try to extraize the uh, Coming to a question where, you know, sometimes the, the capsular bag is still there and the IOL, you can you, you see that, the you know, that um, the uh, there is a rent which has occurred centrally, the IOL has gone down and you kind of like, you maneuver the IOL into the AC somehow and you see the bag still there. So is there any trips where, you know, where you want to salvage the IOL I um, mean, the, uh, the bag, the capsular bag, which is still there. And in what sort of cases you want to uh, like extend, I mean, you want to put a sulcus fixated uh, IOLs and any tips to actually salvage that I, uh, the capsular bag? Dr. Prabhu, your take? Uh, well, yeah. So if you, if you feel the capsular support is intact, uh, you know, definitely one would, uh, one would tend to keep an eye uh, when I was uh, sulcus eye oil, uh, even if it's a dropped one, but uh, I, I assume it's a three piece eye oil, isn't it? Yeah, if you have a three piece eye oil, then how do you go about Do you actually go about uh, salvaging the uh, capsule bag? Mostly, or? I think I, I think if it's you know if you're doing it on the uh, on the same day, if a cataract surgeon uh, is unable to uh, you know probably if it uh, that eye oil drop happens to a cataract surgeon and comes to your side, probably you can do that. But in mostly cases that come to you. Or later, I'm sure uh, you will not have uh, intact rim and all, isn't it? Okay, okay. Uh, there was one uh, discussion by Dr. Fausto. He's talking about when you have a surgical aphakia. So, what do you plan? Do you plan an SFIL or an iris claw? I think that can be asked uh, to Dr. Vaibhav. And do you do a complete vitrectomy in those cases, or do you do a good anterior vitrectomy and place the IOL? Dr. Vaibhav. So if you have a surgical aphakia which has come to you, so how do you plan an SFIL or an iris claw? And in those cases, again, you do a complete vitrectomy or do you do a just put anterior vitrectomy, what you have shown and just place the IOL? Like depending upon whether it is like on the same day or maybe in two weeks of time. So how do you go about with it? I think uh, both options are equally good. It actually depends on the iris tissue that you have. If it's a if there's traumatic aniridia along with it, if there's a, an element of iris chaffing as well as iris atrophy that is there in along with the AFAK, I would tend to definitely go with a sterile fixated lens because there are different techniques and and uh, those and sterile fixation is also a very, very good option that most of the surgeons in India, I think, do advise and do that as well. So, but the iris flow, the advantage of doing iris flow lens would be if the iris tissue is good and it's going to hold, then you have an option of doing a safe technique as safe as SFIOL and having uh, equally good results. And it's slightly, uh, uh, I would say, more effect, more faster and easier to learn than a stellar fixated IOL if you follow the principle and points well. So it all depends on what you're comfortable with. And also, secondly, the iris tissue that you have around you. Thank you, Dr. Weber. One question was, uh, what are the indications like you now, as we have discussed, uh, like we don't tend to get actually, I, uh, I, we need to, like the patients don't come to us directly on the on table or unless you are in a setup where you actually have the anterior segment surgeon and as well as you are sitting. So what are the indications where you see the patient and then you try to put the IOL in the first go after doing an IOL explant? And what are the indications where you would want to avoid in the first go? And because sometimes, most of the times in these sort of patients, you know, like we tend to have some sort of vitreous hemorrhage or the, the cornea is kind of hazy and, you know, you tend to go in and then you see some surprises. So what, when do you plan that this patient is ideal for a primary IOL uh, implant 
after removing the eyewear or when do you plan it later so dr chitranjan can you answer this please yes yes so usually we go for the sfl in the same sitting except some situations where uh, we don't do and those are the presence of inflammation if significant inflammation is there then we try to avoid it and we try to make the eye quieten then only we take for a sfl in a second uh, st- second uh, day surgery or if the iop is very high as you told if the iop is very high or rarely if there is a associated retinal detachment is there in those cases we go for rd surgery put the silicone oil and uh, even though sometimes in those uh, cases the kind of senior surgeons they can put the cell fixed in the same setting but usually we try to avoid so these are the situations where we try to avoid the sfl in the same setting otherwise we we do it in the same setting always dr prabhu if you want to add something to this yeah i agree uh, one more thing if the corneal clarity is not good then probably i would avoid but uh, you know most of the times it's 9 out of 10 times uh, you know we do sfl along with uh, you know i will remove very rarely we do post spawn uh, as chetanjan said those are the indications inflammation and the corneal clarity and uh, other associated retinal issues where you don't want to combine too much uh, the you know on one setting you don't want to do that True. that is the only thing yeah. Uh, there was one question by dr vivek he was asking how do you close these sort of uh, cases like do you do an fae and close it or do you actually leave the bss in the vitreous cavity and close it and what indications do you prefer either of the two uh, dr vepa your take so normally uh, leave bss in the eye if it yeah, possible yeah bss or maybe uh... i mean you leave the fluid or you do an fae and just come out fluid. and normally leave fluid fluid in, the, in such cases you leave fluid uh, what about yeah. uh, dr prabhu or dr chitranjan like yeah, po- post uh, secondary eye wells you are asking isn't it yeah yeah yes so I, i think bss is the saline is the best because you don't want to you know inject yes. air and keep air inside and have eye well tilt or optic capture all of that is a possibility i feel you know if you have something uh, pushing from behind you know that iris eye well uh, relationship can get distorted so I, I personally feel saline is the best. One rare indication may be uh, kind of injecting SF6, maybe if you have associated macular hole where you have to do ILM peeling and kind of uh, do the ILM graft, in those cases, rarely you may go for. Otherwise, generally, BSS, fluid only. Okay, thank you. So now we'll just uh, sum up with some tips for iris claw lenses. I think Dr. Weber can talk about Uh, how do you confirm the enclavation of these eye you have shown it in the video but a line to how to confirm the enclavation and anything specific because sometimes when you enclave it the or oh, the pupils are sometimes oval so how do you avoid that and uh, mm-hmm. how do you maneuver it so that as you were saying there would be corneal folds and uh, do you act- actually extend the tunnel or maybe how do you do you change the intraocular pressure so that uh, it is not affecting much of your visual uh, appearances yeah yes i think uh, what i did i did uh, speak about the importance is you should feel it that's very very important so your hold hold on the optic should be very good your ac should be well formed these all very very important prerequisites for having good enclavation then you you should imagine where what the centration of your lens should be and uh, similarly very very important don't place the uh, haptic very very close to the pupillary margin because otherwise as you say that once it catches it is very difficult to then release it then you have a eccentric pupil for the patient most of the rest of his life so very very important this step is very crucial go to the mid mid uh, mid mid periphery of the iris tissue and uh, slightly tilt it up so that you you can see the mound so you know where exactly is the haptic and the uh, you know the the clip line the claw line so then what you do is either with a 27 gauge needle or whatever you comfortable with the spatula what you need to do is uh, make a, a posterior limbal incision have a posterior limbal incision already there or a limbal incision so to avoid a lot of uh, folds so you don't have to angulate the uh, instrument to the side port it should be as parallel to the iris as possible and then you just uh, along with the traction count uh, i mean a, a, a counter pull or a, a pressure counter pressure you will actually feel the clip and once that happens then only release it otherwise don't release it because that means if you don't if you not felt it it's not happened so in case you feel you know something i might have done something and then leave it you will actually find the uh, the thing has not happened so very very important to feel it and then you will see the dimple on the surface like a pucker on the iris tissue 
Uh, one question to Dr. Prabhu. Do you do a PI in IRS law lenses or uh, what is your experience for doing a PI or do you not do a PI in... Yeah, this is basically, I understand, this is basically to avoid optic capture, isn't it? So optic yeah. capture, definitely it's an issue. What I normally do is, I, the, the, you know, uh, off late, I've started injecting pilocorpine in all my SFIs. At the end of the surgery, I would inject pilocorpine. So I don't do PI. PI is also an option, but I feel pilocorpine works better, they're much better, it's simpler, and, uh, you know, you're not traumatizing any tissue there. So I, I, I feel this is better than uh, creating a PI. Uh, Dr. Weber, your take, uh, why do you actually do and how many times you have seen a uh, post-operative intraocular pressure rise and uh, maybe because is it more inflammatory or it could be because of optic capture or maybe due to malignant hypertension or something? That's a good point, uh, Dr. Prabhu, that the use of pilocarpine, I normally do it before I go, in, go into the iris flow lens because, you know, the iris tissue that you get is more. So, you know, basically, if you have a mid-dilated pupil or a dilated pupil, you don't know where you're enclaving because there is already, uh, you know, the, the iris tissue is kind of uh, already in folds because it's not uh, constricted. So, once you constrict the pupil, one, you have a good plane, good access, you can go behind, you can see the mount and also secondly, you know where the mid-periphery mid of the iris tissue is. Otherwise, you might actually, uh, uh, you know, enclave it very close to the pupillary margin. And uh, secondly, the second thing is, uh, yeah. So, sorry, what is the second, second question you had? I'm so sorry. Uh, I was asking about post-operatively, how do you manage? Because there's a question by Dr. Sachin Shetty is talking about chances of inflammation and cystoid macular edema in iris claw lenses. Correct. So, is there any different management pearls you want to discuss about? I think uh, something very similar to SFIOL, you'll have that pigment dispersion can happen. I have one, uh, two or three cases of mine have had pigment dispersion on the surface because it's very close to the iris tissue. So, you know, if it rubs because of the uh, mesopic pupil or the normal uh, uh, you know, response of the pupil, that will cause some amount of uh, overall, over a period of time, will cause pigment dispersion. And glaucoma should be something which should be washed out. But we do a PI to prevent either pupillary block or optic capture. But otherwise, uh, I've not seen in my uh, uh, experience too much of uh, complications with iris paralysis, but there could be, you need to watch out for them. IOP rise, spike as well as pigment dispersion. So what could be the, you know, learning curve? Like how many, how, how much time do you take initially used to take and now how much time do you take? Because what I understand when I started doing iris flow, I used to take more than an hour. Now it takes five minutes, 10 minutes or And that is where the more the manipulation happens, I think that is where, you know, like you have inflammations which is coming up. So the least, the, the less the amount of manipulation, I think that is where the results of chances of actually having inflammation and macular edema is reduced. And I actually tend to give more uh, oral steroids sometimes in these sort of patients. If you see post-operatively more inflammation or you have manipulated more. So in those patients, I tend to give oral steroids for a short course of like five days each, tapering it off for 20 days. That actually sometimes helps. Yeah. Topical steroids. Can I have a question here? Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 yes, please. So I, I just want to ask uh, Vaibhav, uh, have you come across a situation wherein your uh, you know, iris claw has dislocated or subluxated from one side and one side it's hanging? So how do you go about it? Would you, you know, yes. re-enclave or would you remove it and go for SFL? Or, uh, you know, how do you, the other end is still, you know, uh, the claw is still there. So how are you going to manage that? Exactly. It's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and uh, it happened once intraoperatively and it's happened uh, once postoperatively as well. So the intraoperative uh, time, I was, it was very initial few cases. So I was quite uh, uh, panicky about what, what to do, but I was able to manage because being a VR surgeon, I was able to do the same procedure, just pick it up slightly and then enclave it that time. But in case, you know, as you're saying, if it's already dislocated or uh, one part is uh, come off, then if the iris tissue there is already chaffed, I, you have you have to you know maneuver it and just tease out the uh, other part and remove the inclination if you can. That is your first option. Then maybe place an SFI. Well. It's difficult to do. It's a tough procedure you, because so, you're going to have. Uh, Doctor Weber, do you actually when if, if the entire iris claw is into the vitreous do you tend to use the same iris claw or do you replace it with another one the next time when you're putting it? Or, yeah, or I, do I you see anything that has uh, 
do you check for that enclavation which you were talking about because sometimes yeah, it, I, I, normally, uh, I normally remove it and place an sfi in such such a condition it happened when it has actually so gone down yes so i think uh, we have covered most of the aspects of uh, actually explanting an iwl uh, we have had a good discussion about it our next session would be next week possibly where we'll be discussing about implanting an sfi and uh, we may discuss something about lens drops as well as in that possible session there was one or two questions regarding uh, lens uh, lens drop so maybe we will have another session all together on lens drop but next week we'll be having how do you actually implant an sfi well and how do you actually remove a ctr so that would be the session which would be there next week and i would want to thank uh, dr prabhu dr vaibhav dr abhishek and dr chitranjan for being uh, such a nice panel we had and nice nice discussion we did and uh, thank you everyone and uh, we'll see you next week hopefully thank you so much thank you thank you anish thank you thank you all good night thank you thank you thank you